Judge uh, Judy Matarazzo came uh, today and she said she came to hear my speech. Um, I know that she's just doing this to make up for the fact that uh, after our last trial, she said she'd heard the finest final argument of her life. But the problem was that Jason did the final argument. <laughs> Let's take a moment to appreciate, perhaps celebrate, what we have. We have the honor of serving in one of the last few meritocracies. You don't succeed as a trial lawyer by kissing up to the boss. You don't succeed by becoming a bureaucratic assassin. What matters is what you do. And we celebrate our victories, we own our defeats, and I think we all recognize that our great challenge is to defend the integrity of human beings in the face of institutional domination. So what do we have to work with in that mission? I suggest we have that rarest of combinations of independence and power. Consider our independence. We choose who to represent. What an enormous power that is. And because of that, it is of the essence of our tradition that we are unintimidated. From back to Clarence Darrow, the lawyer for the damned, to those who founded the Oregon Trial Lawyers Association 55, 60 years ago, who remember in the tyranny of the McCarthy era, when Hollywood, with all of its power, knuckled under to the witch hunters, blacklisted, destroyed some of the great artistic talents of their time, when Reed College, the keeper of the liberal flame, cast to the wolves some of its greatest professors, who stood up to the witch hunters it was people like Nick Chavot and Nels Peterson, men who, among others, founded this organization, the first trial lawyer association in the country. And that idea spread across the country. That is our tradition. That is our history. To me, one of the great dispiriting aspects of what we do is watching people lie. People who betray their workers, their patients, even their friends. But we recognize it's in the nature of large organizations to reward cowardice and to punish integrity. And we must always stand with those who stand up against it. Because, because of our independence, we cannot be bullied, pushed around, or broken. But others can, and they need us as their champions. Ralph Nader frequently lectures at law schools, and he talks about independence of lawyers. And when some of these Young people say to him, well, yeah, that's all well and good, but I want to join a big firm. He says, don't you want to be a primary human being? We have independence, and more than that, we have power. Recall in Henry IV, when drunken, bragging Glendower says, I can summon spirits from the vasty deep. And his colleague says, he may summon such spirits, but will they come? Well, we can summon monsters from the vasty deep, from the dark corners. And when we summon them, they have to come. 
and they have to answer questions, and they have to produce documents. Who has such power? Joined with independence. Only we do. Savor the thought. With the great power that comes with our degrees, with our practices, with our independence, comes responsibility. Today, half a million children will be scavenging in the great garbage dump of Lima, Peru. We must each ask ourselves, if we were to speak with one of those children, could we tell them that we are using everything we have, doing all that we can to make this wor world a safer, a fairer, a more honest place, a more just place. Well, what can we do? Our first and perhaps primary obligation is to defend the power of the jury. The ancient Greeks invented the jury. A thousand people might come, 1,500 people might come and gather. People would argue their cause. Better be a good speaker. Well, 1215, the barons of England brought bad King John to heel and forced him to sign the Magna Carta, the second proclamation of which guaranteed the right to a jury of one's peers. When the liberated American colonies were presented with a draft constitution, they said, no, we want a Bill of Rights. And in that Bill of Rights, Number seven, right to a jury trial in civil cases. The jury is perhaps the greatest instrument of social power that ordinary people can wield. The most perfect creation of Western civilization. And your juries, our juries, need to know this story. And if you don't tell them, no one will. So use your voir dire Make it into a history lesson. Tell me, sir, do you know a more democratic institution than the jury that you may be asked to sit upon? Do you know any place where an ordinary citizen who calls out a great corporation might have a fairer chance to prevail? Any place where ordinary people may be called upon to exercise enormous power, power they may never have before or again in their lives. Any place but here? Let them know that the seats they occupy are hollowed ground. Tell them men have died face down in the mud for your right to sit in that booth. In all that you do, honor that. And juries tell us after verdict, and we always want to talk to them if we can, they say, you know, it was an honor to help decide this case. And so it should be. You know, the jurors just want to do what's right. And in law, there are always going to be those who use their keen intelligence to make ever finer distinctions but justice, as we all know, is not going to be found in the fine print. And we also know that if it takes 150 pages to explain taking people's rights away, some folks have been looking too hard. <laughs> well, what more can we do beyond educating our juries? to defend people's rights from those who would usurp them. Well, Jason and I, for the last several years, have gone to uh, an eighth grade class at uh, one of the suburban schools. And uh, it's just the right age to catch them. 
And they say, well, tell us about being a lawyer. What's it like? I say, well, let's put it this way. If you were to be disappointed in the governor and go down to the front steps of the Capitol, put your soapbox down and make a speech and denounce the governor to anyone who would listen, and the governor found it was his or her prerogative to be displeased and sent the state police to get you out of there, perhaps arrest you, shut you up. You could sue the governor. You file papers complaining about the interruption of your rights. Serve a copy on the governor, and you know what? The governor has to show up and defend and explain and maybe win and maybe lose to you. That's what it means to have rights. That's the sort of thing that a lawyer can assist you with. Uh, they had no idea. You say, do you know anywhere else in the world, kids, that's like that, where people can do that? No, there isn't any place else. What else can we do? For reasons unfathomable to me, so many lawyers have an irrational fear of the press. Whatever for? You know, people don't go into journalism to get rich. They love great stories. They want to tell great stories. Who's got the great stories? We all do, right? How many of them have the kind of social impact that means they deserve to be told? Not just about what happened between one person, a couple of people, but which illustrate the problems of our age, or which identify some of those who deserve to be sanctioned. We've got all those stories, fabulous stories, every one of us. What are we going to do? Hey, we, we can cash this one in real quick. They won't want this story out. Kidding me? No. Make a churn. Call the press. Call them early. Call a news conference. Perhaps if you could trust your client enough, let them talk briefly. Set the rules. Gather up your photographs. Take the depositions, get the excerpts, feed them to our friends in the press. Look at this. This is a great story. When, when we sued for uh, uh, Jason Cox, savagely beaten by the Portland police, we put on our website the video camera that the, 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 the video from the camera that cops hadn't known was there, and we put in it our own description of what's going on. Here you see the police looking up and seeing the camera, you know, all that sort of stuff. Trial lasted five days. That video was on Oregon Live all five days with our commentary. The only limits to what we can do with the press are you can't you know, during the week of trial, during the imminency of the fact-finding process, you cannot make a speech to the press about how bad the defendants are. But you, know, you can still quote from the public record even in the middle of trial. And everything it needs there, right? Enormous powers that we have. Why aren't we using them? Let's. I want to talk a minute about punitive damages the purest expression of people's justice. What an extraordinary sword for people to exercise. When I first came up, I would hear the lawyers talk about punitive damages, and they'd say, well, you know, we got the damages, and it's worth this much, and maybe we could add a punitive factor here. And I didn't understand. I said, well, wait a minute. You're talking about institutions, usually, corporations, usually. They need to be punished that probably done this to others, will do this to others if they're unpunished, others similarly situated who probably do the same thing, who would like to do the same thing, who want to get away with the same thing. 
Tell that to a jury. Marvelous things can happen. Punitive damages should be a multiple, perhaps a large multiple of compensatory damages. Beyond that, they can bring compensatory damages along in their wake, make them larger and more substantial. They're not going to spend a lot of time in the jury room talking about compensation when they've got a large punitive damage award to talk about. That's something to talk about. Well, our work has borne out those early notions about how punitive cases should be tried. Um, sadly, that's not the end of the story. Um, Noam Chomsky has written about how corporate power and corporate media define and endorse, enforce, the limits of political debate in this country. They decide what people are going to be talking about. And within that framework, people can be fierce. R's and D's can fight in every way, hook and, hook and tongue, but, but not outside the limits. They cannot, will not be allowed to speak to the larger public in a manner which threatens the present distribution of power. You don't see Noam Chomsky on Meet the Press. We've seen a similar process unfold with the gutting of the jury's power to award punitive damages. Went back this week and looked at the Seventh Amendment to the United States Constitution. In suits at common law, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall otherwise be examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. There was no remediator at common law. Not one case. Yet with the ease that some modern Christians have divined that a rich man can waltz through the eye of a needle, the United States Supreme Court's strict constructionists have discovered that courts are required to gut punitive awards that the court finds to be excessive. Who knows best? Twelve people or a juror or a judge. Worse, here the Oregon legislature says that the state shall lay claim to 70% of any punitive award. Accordingly, this great sword of social justice has been blunted and largely discarded. And how could it be otherwise? Little or nothing for the plaintiff or the, or the attorney, and now, of course, even for the attorney general. A bountiful blessing to the wicked, the legislature imposed on us. Well, this should be a primary target of our group. In the legislature and in the courts, any number of constitutional issues need to be reexamined. New constitutional issues need to be raised. A legislative and legal target for all of us. Punitive damage, I want to talk about just one case. Jonah Johansson, little kid toddler. His little baby brother has a respiratory illness. His parents, enormously responsible people, read the whole label on the box of a humidifier. It says, put it on the floor. Water goes into it, steam comes out, visibly, 212 degrees. The mother goes in to tend the crying child at night. She leaves the door ajar. Little brother comes toddling in, sees the steam coming. We can get our hands away from that kind of heat. Toddlers can't. They don't have that combination of 
of nerve and, 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 and muscle dexterity that allows them to get their hands out of the way before they're catastrophically burned. 40% whole human disability, they say, from the injury to his hands, to his fingers. And Yaz Corporation makes these machines. They've been making them for 80 years, burning people for 80 years, putting them out under the VIX label, largest producer of such instruments in the world. They burned a lot of people, but they said they'd never been sued until Mark and I sued them. You know why they were never sued? I'll give you a clue. When Jonah's mother called up, she was told, well, you know, Mrs. Johansson, the only time we've ever seen burns that severe are when one of the parents holds the child's hands over the over the heating element. She came to us. We had an enormous punitive award. This goes back 15, nearly 20 years, Mark. We had an enormous punitive prayer, and the trial went on for days and days. Henry Cantor assisted. It settled at the very end of the trial. But the story is that our engineer took a look at this machine and, and literally on the back of an envelope, he drew out three different ways it could have been engineered to have the, the steam come out 50, 60 degrees cooler, just that easily. And just before trial, you know what? They changed the whole design from 212 degrees down to 155. One lawsuit didn't even have a verdict. But the great threat of punitive damages, the publicity that comes with it, the possibility of other claims, that's the sort of thing that Oregon's legislature has seen in its infinite wisdom to deprive us of in their gutting of our right to punitive damages. My magnificent partner, Mark McDougall, who should certainly be receiving this award someday, has improved, greatly improved, what Martin Luther King said. Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, said King. Well, I don't see justice everywhere. Mark said, no, 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 he said, justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. More than a century ago, by the power of initiative, which a lot of liberals, labor unions, have done all they can to, to destroy in this state, rather than use it for good purposes because they fear the right wing so much, the great power of the initiative, more than 100 years ago, people used it to create the any evidence standard so that if there is any evidence at all that you can put forward for your claim the judge's role awaits the trial, and you go to trial. That's not true anywhere else. Did you know that? Nowhere else. They all have, everywhere else, all the states, they have a substantial evidence rule. What is substantial what the judge thinks it is? How many righteous claims the juries would have seized upon have been taken from them by overbearing judges because of such rules? But here, in a place which could be the outpost of the resistance, we have that right, that power. People took it for themselves. Also by initiative, the Oregon Constitution denies the court the power to reduce verdicts, other than that imposed by the U.S. Supreme Court on punitives. If you want a million dollars in compensatory damages, the judge here cannot say, well, I'm sorry. I, th I think 300 is enough. That's what you're going to get. Every other state in the union has remediator. We don't. 
What a marvelous place to be. What a great thing to have in our arsenal. Furthermore, we've been spared the horror of partisan elections for judgeships. We've been spared the moneyed interests coming in and trying to buy judgeships, unlike most of the rest of the country. And we even have a tradition of both parties, when they are in power in the governorship, appointing distinguished lawyers to the bar. And you don't see that in other places either. We have so much here. We, as trial lawyers in Oregon, are in a unique position to take leadership, just as we did 60 years ago, in creating the first Association of Trial Lawyers. And how does the present makeup of our Court of Appeals and our Supreme Court play into this obligation and opportunity that we have? Well, we have a superior Court of Appeals, and our present Supreme Court may be the most humane and progressive in the country. They are poised to be perhaps one of the great Supreme Courts in the history of this country. Recall the California Supreme Court under Roger Traynor, which created many of the great opinions which went on to be affirmed to great acclaim by the US Supreme Court of Earl Warren. Stuff came from Roger Traynor, came from the California Supreme Court before the gray men of Nixon's wrecking crew and all that's happened since. All that is needed for our Court of Appeals, for our Supreme Court, is for us to feed them the kinds of creative cases which give them an opportunity to spread their wings. We gotta look at all of our cases and say, is this something that should go up? Is this something that could help? Is this something they would like to sink their teeth into and bring justice to? And remember, we know from Horton, precedents can be overturned. Doors are not closed, ever. Keep it in mind. So, Ralph Nader says that the great failing of trial lawyers is that as they've watched the rights of individuals be systematically stripped away, he says they're always on the defensive, always trying to cling to what they've got. And when you lose something, he says, you never get it back. Not a winning strategy, is it? Well. I suggest that we, each of us, use our voice, our time, our treasure, our opportunity with prospective jurors, with the broader public, with the press, with the politicians, with the trial judges, with our appellate lawyers. We at this convention, we in this room, have the obligation, the power, and the opportunity to turn back the tide so that the dignity and power and the rights of individuals may yet triumph. Thank you.